see you all. We can talk more. Starting a new semester, new talks. I was going to bring down the list of all the seminars, and I usually space it and I didn't do it. But hopefully, everybody got it in their email. Let's the list from for the whole of Montana Tech's uh, seminar series, and then one just the bureau's seminar. Anyway, glad you all came, and I'm very glad today to be to have Hillary Martin here. She's a <coughs> probably newest faculty newest. member at, at U of M in the um, was it the Department of Geosciences. And and Hillary uh, is is born and raised in Missoula, mm -hmm. uh, and she did uh, her undergraduate at U of M, but then she went on to do not one, but two master's degrees in, in the UK, one at the University of College London in space science, and one at Cambridge on volcano, volcano seismology. And then she did her PhD at Caltech. So, mute, mute is a good thing. <laughs> I think it's okay now. So anyway, I, I should just, just hand it over to Hillary and let her speak for herself. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you all for being here today. It's my privilege to be here um, and to have the opportunity to share with you a bit about my research on earth deformation caused by surface mass loading. Um, before I jump in, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, a few of my primary collaborators. Let's make sure this works on this particular project. Um, so these include uh, Mark Simons from Caltech, uh, Luis Rivera, a professor at the University of Strasbourg in France, and then also Sue Owen and Donald Argus at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So let's begin with the question, first of all, is what is surface mass loading? Um, well, broadly defined, surface mass loading is simply the process by which masses that are largely external to the solid Earth apply pressure to the surface. Um, examples of loads include the oceans, the atmosphere, and continental water, such as surface water and groundwater, as well as mountain snow and glaciers. Um, so each of these different loads applies pressure to the surface of the Earth due to its weight. So each one of these loads has mass and it's applying pressure to the surface. Since the Earth is not perfectly rigid, the Earth flexes and deforms under the weight of these loads. So the first key point uh, to make is that it's the weight of these loads that's causing the shape of the Earth to deform. So the shape of the Earth is changing because of these loads. Um, the manner in which this distortion of shape occurs is dependent on the material properties of Earth's interior. So that's our second point. Um, so these loads are not static. The fluid loads are moving around with time, such as with the ebb and flow of the ocean tides, as well as with the accumulation and then subsequent melting of snow in the mountains, for instance, over the course of a year. And this redistribution of mass leads to variations in surface pressure over time, which in turn, in turn causes the shape of the Earth to distort over time. Um, so due to the variety of forces from the oceans to the atmosphere, to rivers, to mountain snow, um, the pressure variations are occurring over a broad range of space and time scales. And this is very good news for geophysicists because what this means is that we have the opportunity to sample Earth's structure across a broad spectrum of spatial wavelengths and temporal periods, including periods that are intermediary between seismic and glacial, where there's currently a gap in our understanding of Earth's response at those periods. Um, so it's worth noting before we move on here that most of the information that we currently have 
on uh, the interior structure of the Earth and the interior dynamics of the Earth is from seismic tomography. Um, but seismic body wave tomography is actually limited in its ability to differentiate between different controls on Earth dynamics, um, such as mechanical versus chemical controls. Um, it's limited in its ability to differentiate between elastic and density structure. But um, this method here, by using surface mass loading as a means of probing the interior of the Earth, this um, type of response, how the Earth is responding to this pressure being applied to the surface and then relieved, um, has both an elastic response as well as a gravitational response. And this means that um, from sensitivity analysis as, analyses as well, that we can independently constrain density and elastic structure in the Earth using a geodetic technique like this. So one of the most prominent types of surface mass loading comes from the periodic redistribution of ocean water due to tidal forcing. And this is a process known as ocean tidal loading. Um, here I'm showing a map. This is the global distribution of the M2 tide, which is a principal lunar semidiurnal tide. It has a period of 12.42 hours. So this is a single harmonic, so it repeats every 12.42 hours. And here I'm just showing the amplitude, um, which is ranging up to, <coughs> this is the scale on the other side, up to a meter here. Um, the scale is saturated though, so in a, in a few select regions it can be several meters in amplitude, this tide. Um, to make sure that we're all on the same page, I just have a couple slides on the tidal potential. Um, tides, of course, are arising due to gravitational interactions between the Earth and external bodies, such as the Moon and Sun. Um, and these gravitational interactions set up differential or unbalanced forces, both within the oceans as well as within the solid Earth, because the Earth has finite size. So the, the gravitational force on one side of the Earth is not the same as it is on the other side. Um, and here I have a schematic diagram showing the Earth-Moon system, and then the resulting tidal bulges here, where the Earth is elongated along that Earth-Moon center line and then flattened at the poles. Now we can represent the tidal potential mathematically at an arbitrary point on the Earth's surface as a series of appropriately weighted Legendre polynomials, starting from degree two. The degree two term is dominant, so that's the only term that I've shown here. This degree two term captures most of the full tidal potential. Um, so this is really it. This is the equation for the degree two tidal potential at this point O on the surface of the Earth that's arbitrary. Um, but this, as written, is not very useful to us because a couple of the parameters in here, R and theta, which have to do with the location of the moon relative to our observation point are very complicated functions of the astronomical ephemeris. So it's very, this is, these are always changing depending on where the moon is relative to our observation point. But fortunately, what we can do is we can expand this potential out in the frequency domain um, in terms of combinations of a small set of fundamental astronomical frequencies. So these theta and R parameters, we're going to expand them out. And so in the frequency domain, what we end up with is an infinite number of harmonics, tidal harmonics. Um, and these are derived from unique sums and differences of astronomical frequencies, such as the orbit of the moon or the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Um, and then if we wanted to recover the total tidal potential, all we would do is sum up all the tidal harmonics back together. Um, so this figure here is showing the amplitude spectra uh, of tidal harmonics. And you can see that a few of them are dominant. So a few of them have much larger amplitudes than others. So we're looking at normalized amplitude on the y-axis and then frequency on the x-axis. So a few of them pop out as being 
much larger, making more significant contributions than other harmonics. And I've boxed a few of them in red because these three we'll look at later in the presentation. Um, you might also notice that we have a few different clusters here. Um, so these, are, these clusters are um, showing us the species of tides, different species of tides. Um, remember, this is frequency in cycles per day. So we have one cluster at about two cycles per day, which are our semi-diurnal tides. Um, we have another cluster at one cycle per day, and then another cluster down here at zero cycles per day. And these are our long period tides. So the reason for these different clusters actually has to do with Earth rotation. Um, but as I said, there's an infinite number of harmonics if you continue to expand that out. So these figures here are just showing if we were to blow up this cluster of diurnal tides, you see there's a lot more harmonics in there. And the same for the semi-diurnal tides here. OK, so um, these are maps of tidal amplitude for the three tides that I had boxed in the <coughs> previous slide. M2 is a tide we've already seen. That was uh, the map I showed earlier. Um, and here I've boxed South America because um, that will be our case study that we'll explore in this presentation. O1 is a principal lunar diurnal tide. It has a period of about 25 hours. Um, you can see the pattern, the spatial distribution of that tide is quite different than M2. Uh, and the amplitude range is also much smaller. So rather than up to about a meter, this is up to about 20 centimeters. And then MF, this is one of the long period tides. It's a fortnightly tide, so about two weeks in period. Again, it has a different spatial distribution. Um, and the amplitude range is only up to about three centimeters. So this tide is very small. Over the course of two weeks, the sea surface height is only changing by three centimeters up and then going back to zero, three centimeters down and back up to zero. So not much variation. Okay, so now let's incorporate some phase information into that because so far we've only looked at amplitude. So this is a movie, if it plays, yep. So this is showing how the tide, the M2 tide in particular, is evolving with time. You can see that time is ticking up at the very top of the map. You can see time ticking away up there. It'll get to 12.42 hours, and then the whole thing will repeat because it's harmonic. Um, where there's, uh, where you see red, that's a time of high tide. So the sea surface height is elevated. And then where it's blue, that's a time of low tide. So the sea surface height is lower than average. Um, you might say to yourself, wait a minute, this doesn't look like the tidal, bulge, <coughs> tidal bulges that we saw earlier. And that's absolutely true. Um, the reason for that is that the oceans are more complicated, okay? They can't assume the shape of the tidal bulges like we normally think about in a theoretical framework. And maybe you can guess why that would be, but um, the reason for this is because we have continents. That's one of the main reasons. So the oceans aren't just free to sort of assume the shape of the tidal bulges like they would want to, but they have to contend with continental boundaries there's some weird stuff where there's really complicated coastlines going on. Um, and also, the ocean floor is not smooth, so we have bathymetry. And so that's why the pattern is more complicated than what you might have thought. Um, OK, so this is what I would call our load. And this water has mass to it, so it has a weight. And therefore, what if you were on the ocean floor and you were measuring the pressure, over the course of 12.42 hours, you would detect a change in pressure on the ocean floor because of this tide. And since the Earth isn't perfectly rigid, the Earth is flexing and deforming under those changes in pressure. So on the next slide, I'm going to show another movie 
but I'm going to overlay over the continents how the solid earth is responding to this tide. Okay, so again, we're looking at the same tide. So the forcing is the M2 tide. And then over the continents, we're looking at the vertical response of the land to that tide, to the change in sea surface height. Um, and so it's, it's vertical displacement. Here's the, the scale here for that vertical response. It's uh, plus or minus 10 millimeters, so plus or minus a centimeter. This scale is also saturated, so in some areas it's actually much more variation than this. For example, okay, so if we just take an example here right on the coast of Brazil, for instance, you can see that when the high tide comes in, the land is depressed downward. By a few centimeters. Later on when you have the low tide, that means mass has moved away and the land can rebound back upward by a few centimeters. So it's kind of fun just to look in different parts of the world and <laughs> see, how, see how the earth is actually responding. Um, of course, the, the earth is also deforming in the ocean basins as well. Um, so we could show this vertical displacement globally, um, but I'm just overlaying the forcing as well so you can see. Yeah. Does this model take into account the continental shelves and the structure of the, of the crust? So this model, uh, it's modeled with PREM, so I do have to assume an Earth structure, that's true, but it's globally average structure. So, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I haven't incorporated lateral heterogeneity such as the difference between a continental shield area versus an ocean basin. I'm just saying the shelf off Brazil is different than the shelf on the east and west coast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a uh, spherically symmetric globally averaged earth structure that's gone into this simulation. So it looks like South America and Africa go through vastly more extreme swings than North America does. Um, yeah, could be. Alaska gets a big tide offshore as well. Um, the M2 tide isn't so significant off the east coast of the U.S. Um, so it's really dependent on, on the load. So there, there's this big um, load from the M2 tide off the coast of Brazil, another off the coast of Africa, and so that's what's determining what the response is in this case, since it is globally average structure. In Russia, for instance, you don't really observe any displacement from the M2 tide. Um, but different tides like O1 and M, the fortnightly tide, MF, um, have different spatial characteristics as well. So from different tides, you may get more response in North America than you would in Africa, for instance. I don't know if that fully answered your question, but. Okay, so in summary, our motivation is to exploit observations of Earth's um, response to surface mass loading in order to learn something more about Earth's interior structure, the chemical, the mechanical, the thermal conditions that are inside the Earth. Um, and I'll mention here too that so this will be the main focus of this presentation. This, this is the motivation that will drive most of the talk. Um, but at the end, I'm going to bring up two more applications, important ones that are emerging, um, that also use Earth's response to surface mass loading, but in different ways for different motivations. So we'll, we'll come to that at the very end, but this will be our main focus. So the, the actual theory of load-induced deformation is nothing new, per se. Um, this is a book that was published in 1899, more than a century ago, by George Howard Darwin, who was the son of the more famous Charles Darwin. And he had a chapter in his book that was um, called The Elastic Distortion of the Earth's Surface by Varying Loads. And he has this nice diagram here of his artistic interpretation of how the Earth re responds to a pressure applied at a, at a single point, 
in which he calls a, a dimple in an elastic surface. Um, nearly a century later, uh, a person by the name of William Farrell wrote a seminal paper on the deformation of the Earth by surface loads. And uh, this paper significantly advanced the theory of how we do simulations for, for modeling how the Earth responds to surface loading. Um, but due to reasons of precision and sensitivity and network density, early attempts to actually implement that theory using geodetic techniques such as gravity, strain, and tilt were limited in effectiveness. Um, and so this is an example, a prime example, of a case in which theory preceded our ability to actually measure something and be able to apply it practically. Um, but now, very recently, with the advent of satellite navigation systems, such as the global positioning system, which we all have in our phones and our cars, um, GPS and more broadly, GNSS systems, which infer ground displacements directly <coughs> rather than um, derivatives of ground displacements, and with high precision, have the ability to overcome our prior limitations. So now we're finally getting to the point where we can actually take the theory that's been developed and apply it to the study of the Earth. Um, and one of the first studies to do just that, using the GPS data to, as constraints to constrain allowable models for Earth structure, was um, by Takeo Ito and Mark Simons. Back in 2011, they published this in Science. And they used GPS observations of the M2 tide and how the Earth responds to M2 tidal loading in order to um, infer the structure, crust and mantle structure, in the western United States. OK, so this, this first section of the talk where we're talking about how uh, probing Earth structure using Earth's response to surface mass loading um, I've structured that into three parts. And the first, we'll talk about how do we model that deformation? How do we make the simulations? In the second part, we'll talk about how do we measure them? And then in the third part, we'll compare our observations with our models. OK, so this is the equation that we use to simulate Earth's response to surface mass loading. And it's easier to to understand if we pick it apart bit by bit. So um, on the left-hand side of the equation here in the red box, this is our displacement response at a particular observation point. So for instance, at a particular GPS station. Um, and then on the right-hand side is an integral here. In the, in the green box, we have what are called Green's functions. And the Green's function is what contains information about our Earth structure. So um, essentially, the Green's functions allow us to map our force, which is our load, to the response. So the Green's functions contain information about Earth structure that tells us how is the Earth going to respond to a particular force. And then on, on this far right side, we have our force. And so in the blue box, we have the density of the load. And in the orange box, we have the height of the load. So we can work out how much mass is there. And then we're integrating over the entire surface of the Earth. If we're talking about an ocean tide as the source, then we only need to integrate over the area of the oceans. But, um, so in looking at this equation even more simply, Effectively, we have a displacement. That's what we want to simulate. Is equal to a displacement per unit force, and that's given by our Green's function, times our force, which is our, our load model. So to perform this forward calculation, if we want to compute what is the displacement at a particular point on the Earth, we need to know 
two things. First of all, we need to know what the Green's functions are. So we have to compute those based on our structure. And the second thing we need to know is our force. And so that's our load model. So it's what is the density and what is the height of the load. Um, and so we can, uh, that information for the ocean tides, for instance, is coming from the um, tidal amplitude and phase across the oceans. And then we will um, input a density of seawater, which we assume is uniform globally. Um, so there are pre-existing software packages that actually make this forward calculation. One of them is called Spottle. Um, it's developed by Duncan Agnew at Scripps. And this is available to, to compute displacements um, using standard sets of load grains functions from the literature. However, for our purpose, we want to use observations of the Earth's response to loading in order to be able to work back out what is the structure. How can we refine structure, uh, our structural models for the Earth, knowing what we know about how the Earth is responding to a particular load. So for us, it's not enough just to have a framework where we are using pre-computed Green's functions for a couple Earth models. Um, what we need is the ability to eff effectively compute our own Green's functions, where we can predict these load-induced displacements for any sort of generic, spherically symmetric Earth model. And so what we did was we built this software in-house ourselves um, to be able to generate the Green's functions for any spherically symmetric Earth model. We're calling this software load def, um, and we feel like it's to a point now where it's ready to be released to the public. Students at University of Montana are already working with the software, so if anyone's interested in playing around with it, experimenting with it, um, please let me know. We'd be happy to have you work with it. Um, and by the way, it's, it's general, it's not specific to the ocean tides, but um, we can also use this software to model how mountain ranges subside and uplift when you have variations in snowfall from year to year, so, um, or changes in lake volume, for instance. So any kind of load that you know what that load is and you can define it, you can plug that into to the software, to this equation, and compute at a particular point what is your displacement from that load. So what do the results look like? So again, the, the case study we're looking at here is for South America. Um, each one of the, these ellipses corresponds to the location of a GPS station. And of course, for the simulations, we could simulate the response anywhere. But later on, we're going to compare with observations from GPS sites. So we're computing at those same locations so we can make the comparison. Um, OK, so each ellipse that you see here is centered on the, the site of a GPS receiver in South America. The color of the ellipse is showing us the vertical displacement response of that station to the M2 ocean tide offshore. And the size and orientation of each ellipse, here's a reference here, that's showing us the horizontal displacement response. <coughs> so on the coast of Brazil, some of these red ellipses here, that's about four centimeters of displacement <coughs> in amplitude. So that means over the course of 12 0.42 hours, it's actually 8 centimeters of peak-to-peak -peak displacement. So if you were standing on the coast of Brazil and you stood there for 12.42 hours, you would actually move up and then down and then back up by about that amount. You would actually move by that amount. And you don't really feel it because that deformation is spread out across such a large area, but you would actually be moving up and down by that much. Um, so we can look at that as a movie as well. So again, at the top, you can see time ticking by. Once it gets to 12.42 hours, it'll repeat. 
Um, you can watch the colors change on these ellipses. So right now, uh, let's see. So the low tide is coming in right now, the blue. That means that mass has been removed. And so the ground is uplifted. And by on this scale, it's plus or minus four centimeters. So when the high tide comes in, the ground is depressed downward by about four centimeters. And then when the low tide comes in, the ground is uplifted by four centimeters. Um, and the black line in each ellipse is showing us the direction of the horizontal displacement at any given time. And since it's harmonic, that means that this ellipse is closed in space. So every 12.42 hours, it's simply repeating again and again. Um, these are the two inputs I used to create this particular model. I assumed PREM structure and an ocean tide model from a, friend, a group in France called FES 2012. There are more recent versions of this model now. but Okay, so so far we've explored how to model load-induced surface displacements, and now we'll look at how we measure them. So part two will be measuring displacements caused by ocean tidal loading. Um, so we are using um, GNSS or GPS data. GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite Systems, and this is an umbrella term for all naviga satellite navigation systems. So GPS, like we have in our phones, this is the US component of that. And so GPS is one component of GNSS. In the top, um, this is an image from UNAVCO, a geodetic consortium of a GPS station in Alaska. So this is what sort of a scientific installation of a GPS station looks like. Um, it's embedded, it's, um, it's uh, drilled into the bedrock so um, that it's held stationary and it's moving with the bedrock. So ideally, the only motion that this GPS station is detecting is from movements of the bedrock, uh, the solid earth itself. Hopefully not with too many uh, side effects either. Um, and then this is an artist, artist's impression of the satellite, the navigation satellites in orbit around the earth. So our network consists of 160 GPS stations in South America. And these are maintained by either the governments or the militaries of Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. Um, each station, we have up to 14 years of data. The median time series length is about five years. So we have long time spans of data from these stations. Um, we process the GPS data kinematically, which means that it's high rate. So we're estimating positions every five minutes, usually from 30 second data. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. And then once we generate our time series from the raw data, then we need to extract the tidal signals out of that. And so we're using harmonic analysis to do that. Um, I've highlighted a few of the stations here in red. Uh, these stations are up at the mouth of the Amazon River and these stations here are on the Patagonian shelf. In these places, the ocean tide models are not well constrained. And so um, sometimes we will not use these stations in our analysis. Okay, there's a lot of information on this slide, which I don't expect you to read, other than if you process GPS data yourself, then you'll appreciate seeing that. Um, but if not, don't worry about it. Um, but I also put it up here for the purpose of um, being able to demonstrate um, or highlight that the, in order to um, extract and uh, tidal signals and GPS data, this is a, a non-traditional GPS product. So it's something that we have to process ourselves in-house. There are pre-processed GPS time series available online, but these are at daily epochs. Um, and also, ocean tidal signals are removed at the processing stage. So standard processing actually involves removing ocean tidal loading from the time series as a source of noise. But in our case, we want to use it as our signal. 
So we have to process the data ourselves. And this is the part of the procedure that we use to do that. And then once we have our time series, then um, we need to be able to identify the amplitude and phase of each of the main tidal harmonics that we are able to isolate given the length of our time series. And so this is the model that we use to do the harmonic analysis. Um, first of all, so this is the result, the displacements that are in the time series. We have a constant offset term. We have a linear trend. Um, but then this part over here that's in the summation, um, this is the information that we want to solve for for each of our tidal harmonics. Essentially, we're looking for an amplitude and a phase. And there's a lot of other information in here, but everything that's above the green line are known functions of the astronomical ephemeris. So these, you can get this information from astronomical textbooks. Um, we know where the position of the moon is relative to the Earth and where the sun is relative to the Earth to uh, pretty high accuracy. And so all that's contained within these terms. Um, so we also developed the software to do this inversion in-house as well. It's written in Python, so we called it PyTide. Um, and these are the results of running PyTide on our GPS time series. This is for a, a GPS station called Rio2 in Brazil. Um, we have in the top two panels the east component of displacement. In the central two panels, we have the north component. And in the bottom two panels, we have the vertical component of displacement. And the GPS time series that uh, we have processed at our five minute epochs are shown in blue. And then we've made our model fit to that data using the equation I just showed. That, that's our harmonic analysis where we're um, identifying, making a fit of the tidal harmonics to our data. And so that's overlaid as the black line over the over the actual time series. And the bottom panels of each pair are showing the residuals, which we also show as histograms on the right hand side. Those are the residuals between observation and model. Um, so as you can see, the model does a pretty good job of explaining a lot of the variance that's in this time series, um, but fitting the GPS time series. And I also want to note that this particular station had seven years of data. And so we're making this model fit over the full seven years. But this is just a random snapshot of one week within that seven years. So we're fitting harmonics that are like, that are half a day to a day in period over seven years. And we're looking at a snapshot of just one week. And this is what the fit looks like. So then we can do the same that we did for, for, the, for the model, for the simulation, is we can take the, um, the east, north, and vertical amplitude and phase information from our GPS time series that we've extracted using harmonic analysis and also plot it up using these particle motion ellipses. So again, each one of these ellipses is centered on the location of a GPS station. The color is denoting the vertical displacement response, and the size and shape of the ellipse is showing the horizontal, um, the horizontal uh, displacement response. So, um, yeah, which again is up to four centimeters of vertical displacement. Um, but this is informed by our GPS time series and then the harmonic analysis of that. And again, we're just showing the M2 tide here. So next, we will um, compare our observations with our models. So we've seen both of these plots before. The one on the left side is the one we were just looking at. This is our uh, observed data from the GPS. And on the right-hand side, this is our simulated data using PREM structure 
and an ocean tide model from a group in France called FES 2012. So at this scale, we're hard pressed to be able to decipher any significant differences between our observations and our model. We can also make the comparison with a movie. And so now you can actually look at how the horizontal components are evolving with time. So we have phase information in here as well. Remember the black line is showing you the direction of horizontal displacement at each moment in time. And the color is showing you the actual vertical displacement at each moment in time relative to a, um, like a, an average value. So um, the color bars on the right and left hand sides are showing that vertical displacement plus or minus four centimeters. And then we're still showing high and low tides um, in the oceans. So again, it's hard to decipher any significant differences between our observation and our model. Um, now at the beginning, we had looked at maps of not just M2, but also a diurnal tide with a period of 25 hours and a fortnightly tide with a period of two weeks. And they had different spatial patterns and they had different amplitude ranges. So M2 was by far the biggest. Um, O1 was uh, sort of in the middle, so it ranged up to about 20 centimeters of, in terms of sea surface height variation. And then the fortnightly tide was only up to about three centimeters of ocean height variation. So this is the small one. Um, but we can still, so on the left are the observations and on the right are the predictions, the model predictions. So you can compare side by side how well did we do with observing that tidal harmonic, the response to that ocean tidal loading by that harmonic using GPS data. And on the right is our forward modeled simulation. Um, so where this, the load is larger, um, we can see that the correspondence, the agreement between the two appears to be much um, better. Um, but we still see a good resemblance between um, observations and model, e even for a very, very small tide. Okay, and in, in this figure we're looking at on the left hand side, still for M201 and MF, but two sigma standard deviations in the, that we've estimated on our GPS data processing, so both in the time series and our harmonic analysis of that. And then on the right are the residuals between observation and model. So for the M2 tide, our residuals are above the noise level or above our estimated uncertainties from the GPS data processing. Um, once we get down to the fortnightly tide, we're more sort of within the noise. At best, we're on par with the noise with our estimated uncertainty. So let's return here. This is our comparison for the M2 tide between observation and model and take a closer look at the residuals. Um, the scale here for the residuals is up to one millimeter. Only one station is sort of getting up into that range. So uh, again, these are our discrepancies. The misfit between our model and our observations so it's remarkable to take a moment to step back and to think about this. Think about how small one millimeter is. One millimeter is very, very small. Most of these residuals are just a very small fraction of one millimeter. So think about how small a tenth of a millimeter is. It's almost like you can't even measure it with a ruler. But these are the residuals between our observations and our model. And think about everything that goes into that, into the collection of the GPS data, um, into uh, the propagation of signals from satellite through the atmosphere to the GPS station. In our harmonic analysis, we don't have infinite length time series, so 
we have to do our best to isolate the harmonics that we can, but there's other stuff in there. There's tectonic noise in there. Um, so the GPS is all a whole host of um, aspects that are going into our processing uh, and analysis of the GPS data. And then also, on the modeling side, we have to um, make certain assumptions, which I'll talk about later as well, such as we've assumed spherically symmetric structure, for one, so we haven't accounted for lateral heterogeneities. Um, so all of that is contained within here, and yet the residuals are a fraction of a millimeter. So even with all those assumptions and uh, um, uncertainties in the GPS and everything, our observations and models are in very good agreement. So we can then also make comparisons. Um, that was for a particular forward model using PREM and a particular ocean tide model. But what if we swapped out, what if we used an ocean tide model from a different group? Because these are hard, can be challenging to determine as well. Um, and then what if we swapped out different Earth models? So each one of these figures is showing residuals that are based on a different forward model calculation. And there are two important things to note here. The first is that there's a good consistency between each of these panels. So this indicates that we're relatively insensitive to swapping out a different model for Earth structure or trying out an ocean tide model from a different research group, for instance, that might be developed in a different way. Um, the second thing is that the residuals do not appear to be random, um, but they appear to exhibit at least some spatial coherency. So this is suggesting that these residuals cannot be explained solely by random observational error, for instance. There is some spatial coherency here that does not seem random. So how might we explain this? Um, so here are our residuals again. Uh, what we posit is that um, the assumptions we've made in terms of what, how we've defined our, uh, how we compute the Green's functions and then generate the forward model are that we've had to assume spherically symmetric, non-rotating, elastic and isotropic structure or SNREI structure. Um, but this is clearly not the case in reality. Uh, this is a seismic tomography profile at 200 kilometers depth through the South American continent. So we have the um, continental, the South American craton is showing up real nicely here as a high uh, seismic velocity anomaly. Um, and then we have um, a, a slower seismic velocity anomaly surrounding that area. Um, so what we're interested in trying to figure out is maybe if these residuals could be explained by deficiencies in, um, in the <coughs> standard globally averaged Earth models for being able to make these kind of predictions and being able to explain the observations. So what we're hoping is that eventually we're going to be able to use our observations to better constrain the elastic and density structure through the craton um, and potentially even in three dimensions. And uh, so we're just starting our project now. It's actually difficult to move into three dimensions because we have to abandon the Green's function framework and move into a fully numerical approach. Um, so this is some of our preliminary work in terms of even generating a three-dimensional spherical mesh. We're adapting a seismic tomography code to be able to try to do this for the surface mass loading problem. Refining our mesh along the coastlines because that's where, um, where you have the short load to receiver distances. You need much higher resolution in your model. So things like that that we're um, working on and hope to begin a sensitivity study maybe even this summer. Okay, uh, so we're running a little bit low on time. But I just wanted to briefly mention a couple of the other applications. 
Um, and one of them, because I know there are water scientists here, is using Earth's response to surface <laughs> mass loading to not just look at Earth's structure, but to actually constrain the spatial distribution of the load. So this is an example from California where we're using GPS to track water resources in the Sierra Nevada and the Central Valley. So this was a period of heavy precipitation from 2009 to 2011 where that we uh, could measure land subsidence using GPS. We did an inversion of that to estimate how much water was infiltrating the system over that time period that would cause this subsidence. And so this is showing up to three quarters of a meter of additional water that was um, being added to the Sierra Nevada and the Central Valley over this two year time period. And that's solely from our GPS observations and our modeling that we're able to determine that. We see the opposite during periods of drought. This was a severe drought from 2011 to 2015, also in California. When so much of that water mass was removed during the drought, then we measured significant uplift of the ground, which we then inverted to infer how much water was lost from the system. Um, and it was up to about one meter in some parts of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, and the amount of water that we determined that was lost or gained during periods of drought or heavy precipitation is actually more than what's contained within hydrology models. Um, and so we infer this to mean that there is more water that's being stored deep in the ground and being lost during years of drought from reservoirs deep in the ground, so groundwater, um, that is currently captured in hydrology models. And the last um, motivation or application that I wanted to mention is that by accounting for surface mass loading in a very accurate way, then we can remove that as a source of noise from GPS time series and improve our ability to detect and analyze tectonic and volcanic deformation, which is important for um, assessment of natural hazards. So for instance, we had looked at a time series like this before, this is about a week, and we can see that most of this variation in the GPS time series is explained by ocean tidal loading. If we look at another time period, this is now eight months, we can see that much of this scatter, this is a station in Alaska, can be explained by high and low pressure atmospheric weather systems coming through the area. So even the atmosphere has mass and the Earth responds to that as well. And then finally, this is an eight year time period and we see that seasonally, most of the scatter in the GPS is explained by this yearly seasonal hydrologic loading, mostly from snow in the mountains and then melt runoff. So when the land is depressed, that's mostly in the springtime when you have the most snow in the mountains. And then in the summer and fall when the snow is melting away, then the land is uplifting again. And in tectonically active Japan, if you actually remove all those signals from the time series, you can reduce the scatter, the RMS scatter of the time series by up to 10 to 50% depending on location. Okay, so this is the summary. Um, precise geodetic measurements and models of Earth's response to surface mass loading can provide insight into Earth's interior structure um, also help us to track surface mass storage and flow through a landscape. And this is important for um, managing our water resources um, as well as um, climate studies. And the last one is that we can improve our assessment of natural hazards by improving our ability to remove noise from time series and therefore enhance detection of other geophysical signals of interest. And I didn't want to end without at least touching on the um, collaboration that we have now between the University of Montana and the Bureau of Mines and Geology, which is studying earthquakes um, in Western Montana. So these are just a few photos 
of our earthquake study out in the field. Um, by a show of hands, how many people felt the Lincoln earthquake about two years ago? So most of you felt that earthquake. I was actually out of the country at the time. I didn't feel it, um, unfortunately. But um, all of our stations that we have deployed right now in this deployment are around Lincoln. So we're still measuring aftershocks from that event. And you see Mike in a couple of these photos. This is Mike, and Mike's up there in that photo as well. Um, and the rest are students from the University of Montana. And I'll just end here with this map. Lincoln is here. Um, the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology stations are shown by the upright yellow triangle. So that's most of the stations that are in this area. But we're trying to add to that with our red and orange diamonds. So these are stations um, from the University of Montana in collaboration with the Bureau of Mines and Geology that we've just deployed within the last couple of years. So, okay, I will end there. Thank you. Thinking about the phenomena of the ocean tides and I mean, the ground tides, and I, I would I mean, then those nice ovals that have little arrows going around them is, is some of, I mean, so I, I can imagine that the period, the 12.42, yep. whatever it is, hours, <clears throat> but there would be a phase lags. Um, because it wouldn't all be in lock sync because the mechanical properties of the continents and the mechanical properties of the ocean are different and even in the continents there are differences in the mechanical properties there and I was yeah. wondering if anybody is trying to learn anything from the, the phase sure. lag of um, Th those small uh, raises and lowers or sh shifts to the east or west or yeah so actually perhaps somewhat surprisingly it's um, virtually a purely elastic response at these periods so it is when the high tide is coming in the er the land even in central Brazil is responding effectively instantaneously to that load, which is sh shocking. It doesn't seem like it should be that way. But the, the, the phase leg at those periods is effectively negligible at the resolution of our GPS data to be able to measure that. Um, so even up to a year time scale, seasonal, even at that scale, we're still able to um, model that effectively fully in the elastic regime so that it's happening instantaneously. Um, but it is a very interesting question, too, about um, deviations from that perfect elastic model. Um, and certainly, we do want to explore that. So that's part of the assumptions that we've made in, um, in developing our models, is that it's a purely elastic system. Um, but, but one of the reasons it, it's great and we're interested in these different tidal bands from semi-diurnal to two weekly and maybe even up to monthly or yearly is that it's an opportunity to explore Earth's response in these different period at different periods um, and so certainly I mean we're on a spectrum that there will be some phase like some anelasticity that's at play to some extent um, but as you can see, even from the residuals here, and we've assumed that it's a purely elastic response, that it's happening instantaneously, and there are very small differences. So it's a great question, um, but yeah, we haven't explored So the that model yet. would show that no phase like just because of the assumptions, but I mean, yep. that the GPSs are but we actually in lockstep too. 
Exactly, and we effectively are not able at the yeah, resolution of our GPS now to be able to differentiate any phase lag. So it's effectively happening instantaneously, and it's a very good assumption at 12.42 hours to consider the response elastic. And distances of thousands of kilometers? Yeah, any, because actually in the model, to, to compute the response at this particular station in the middle of South America, we're even incorporating tides that are on the other side of Russia. So tides globally are being, are contained within this model. Although when you get to f further distances, then they're not contributing as much because they're further away. But they're still part of the model. And if you, if you exclude them, then the observations and predictions do not match up so well. Yeah. You've gone with the trouble of sorting out all of the types, like one M2 type. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you take all of the types and stack them up when the phases come together and come apart and you get extremely high tides and then almost no tides? How do you show that in your model? Mm, um, stretch the timeline out how far, I guess I should say. Uh, stretch the timeline out. Well, yeah, I mean, so, so there are in, an infinite number of tidal harmonics, right? Okay. Um, but more than 90% of the actual tide can be explained by just a, a handful just of tidal harmonics. Major. Yeah, so maybe it, you could take 10 of the top tidal harmonics, and that's going to explain the vast majority of the tide that you'd actually observe if you went to the ocean right now and put a stick in and measured the tide. Of those combined over a short amount of time. Yeah, and um, I mean there are tides that are contributing that are at monthly and yearly time scales that um, we could probably that can be measured. Um, so we have models for the monthly tide and models for the yearly tide, and all of those are harmonic. So each one on its own, we could create its own ellipse and things. Um, when we start summing them all together, now we've combined different harmonics, so we'd probably have to show it visually in a different way, but it'd still be a, an elastic response. And I mean, once you- Just an amplitude difference. Just an amplitude difference, yep. I mean, probably once you get beyond yearly or towards yearly, then, then you might be able to see some of this phase difference um, but also those tides are so small, I don't think we'd be able to observe them accurately um, at the precision of GPS right now. They do. So the um, spring neap tidal cycle, for instance, but this is just a beating phenomenon between um, the M2 and S2 tides, lunar and solar semidiurnal. Yeah, and it's, it's just a beating between two tidal harmonics, so it's not its own, it's not a harmonic in and of itself, it's just a, a beating between two frequencies that you'll start out low and then you'll get high and then you'll come back to low, so. Yeah, but good question, that's interesting. Yeah? Is that a question like in Central South America where you have the really thin ellipses and then they're... Yeah, the idea yeah. Um, so, like here, for instance. Um, so in this case, uh, and the this thinness of the ellipse, this, the shape of it has to do with the horizontal response. Um, and the horizontal is mostly responding to, it's mostly telling us information about where the load is located. So um, notice these ellipses are all kind of pointed in this direction, and that's where the big load is, the big high tide and big low tide off the coast of Brazil there. So they're all sort of oriented in that direction. It's interesting because a lot of people do analysis just with the vertical component, but it's actually the horizontal that gives you information on where the load is located. Um, so in this region, I suspect it's just to have to do um, with where the, the load is relative to the station and that it's basically just moving forward and backward and forward and backward. But it's a great question, yeah. Yeah. I almost apologize if this is too simplistic. But my, my interest is um, in modeling, you know, glacial retreat, uh, glacial retreat going on up and down. 
is this model at all appropriate for such time periods of 60 years or what so I think 60 years, then you're really potentially getting into the regime where you'd have to be concerned about <coughs> anelastic effects. Yeah. Um, and again, this is a purely elastic model. So my rule of thumb is that we're pretty OK in the elastic, regi elastic regime up to about a year or so. Mm -hmm. um, but to be honest, I, I haven't really explored much beyond that either, like comparing observations with the model or anything like that. Um, we wouldn't have observations for Glacial Lake Missoula, but, um, but I mean, certainly you could, you could try if you knew how much mass was being lost from the system uh, over a 60-year time period, you could compute what the displacements of the surface would be. Um, but with the caveat that this is an elastic model, and once you get to decades, you may need to consider anelastic effects as part of that. Is it the, <coughs> the model is spherically symmetric. That's correct. Yeah. And it's elastic. Yeah. So is it elastic all the way to the center of your model? Yes. Or? We do include the fluid outer core. OK. Um, yes. Um, what do you do about the core? Yeah, so uh, we, in order to compute the Green's functions, we actually have to start from the equations of motion. So conservation of linear momentum, and we start from the center of the Earth. We compute uh, solutions to the equations of motion for a homogeneous sphere, which is an analytical solution. And then we integrate all the way out to the surface. And then once we get to the surface, we apply our boundary conditions, which is a normal traction. And then um, gravity from, because it's a mass, so it has gravity, so we apply <coughs> gravita gravitational force as well. But um, it's only for the lower spherical harmonic degrees that we have to actually integrate through the whole Earth. But we apply different boundary conditions at the solid fluid boundary as we enter the inner core. And it actually reduces the system down to a fewer fewer equations because we don't some are undefined because we're in a fluid region, um, so it's less well constrained the particle motion. But we do integrate through the fluid outer core and apply boundary conditions to get back to the solid mantle and integrate to the surface. I I do have some more information um, on how we do that, and so it's effectively we're computing love numbers which maybe some of you have heard of that even for um, body tides, tidal love numbers, such as K2, um, which is one of the main tools that they have for studying the interior, of, um, interior structure of planets in our solar system. So when they don't have a lander to go ahead and deploy a GPS, they use gravity to measure these tidal love numbers. Um, and so it's the same exact idea as that same equations, same model, same even as for the normal modes. Um, but we just apply different boundary conditions at the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing you mentioned in terms of the, the, the use of this information is earthquake prediction. But I remember reading about I remember reading about using surface moving models uh, as a, well, I, I, you know, at one time somebody claimed that they could use that for earthquake. Um, and I think it was, as far as I know, also debunked shortly there. Okay. But, you know, it seems to, you know, this. Well, it's modulating the stress field. Yeah. So there is strain in the earth when. The Earth is compressed and stretched because of the surface mass loading. That's absolutely happening. Um, and you can find correlations, mostly seasonally. Um, sometimes it may be due to seasonal changes in pore pressure, but it may also be due to seasonal loading and unloading of the Earth. So you're compressing and you're stretching. This is changing the stress field. And you can actually generate earthquakes that way. So you might have an increase in earthquakes when 
you're unloading snow from a region and expanding that region out. Um, and there have been correlations like that that have been found. So in some ways, you could forecast that there will be more earthquakes at this time of year when the snow is unloading or something like that. Um, but as far as use it, it, it's also small stress changes. So it's definitely not like across the board. But um, it's an interesting point, And I guess I don't really know enough about that to speak to it. But yeah. Well, thank you. That's good. Thank you. Thank you.